Okay. Carmen Tafoya. How many of you knew Carmen Tafoya or of her before you came out tonight? She is the author of more than 30 books, the State Poet Laureate of Texas and currently president of the Texas Institute of Letters. Carmen has been called by the Roots author Alex Haley, quote, a world-class writer and recognized by the National Association of Chicana and Chicano Studies for work which, quote, gives voice to the peoples and cultures of this land. She's the recipient of the America's Award presented to her at the Library of Congress in 2010, five International Book Awards, two Tomas Rivera Book Awards, three LA, ALA Notable Books, a Charlotte Zalatov Award and the Art of Peace Award, top 10 books for babies, which is really cool among others. She was presented the key to the city of Dallas and it says here when she stopped at a gas station on her way out of town, it did cross her mind to see if it would work to turn on the gas pump, but it didn't, at least that's what she told the police when they checked for the skimmer that she was putting on the, the gas machine. Please give it up for the state. Laureate, the Poet Laureate of Texas, Carmen Tafoya. Sorry, I didn't see you there. Woo. Okay, I gotta bring it down here to the chaparrita level. Ah, oh, thank you. I, I, before we get started, I want to thank Sama and the Pechacucha organizers and all of you in the audience that came out here not knowing if it was going to be hot or cold, you know, San Antonio goes. Um, and my fellow presenters, I'm, I'm flooded with joy at the beauty of the people out here. And I'm honored to be with you because each one of you carries your stories inside you, sometimes in your eyes, sometimes in your scars, sometimes in your wrinkles. And if you ask, what do my stories matter? Well, you're in luck tonight because the topic of my presentation is the power of stories. Okay, I come from a long line of stories. Stories that begat stories that begat stories. We ate stories, we carried stories, we dreamed stories. I come from a long line of stories, but from a house that had no books. My side of town wasn't known for its great schools, but for its pothole dirt streets. When my neighborhood kept fighting the city just to get its streets fixed, my aunt stuck me in a pothole to show how deep it was. The west side was considered so dangerous, even the cops didn't come around. My father called once and got San Fernando Street. Well, sir, that's what you got to expect on the west side of town. And the policeman hung up. Everywhere we turned, we got no, no playground equipment, no libraries, no speaking Spanish. My junior high was called the toughest school in town by the teachers who frisked us every day to make sure we had no knives, no mirrors, no teased hair, even though the biggest style of that era was teased hair. We asked, ma'am, how come we can't have mirrors in our purses? Because when you get in a fight, you'll break it and slash someone. Ma'am, how come we can't have teased hair, ma'am? Because when you start a fight, you reach into your hair, pull out the knife, and stab somebody. Oh, we learned a lot in junior high. Like how the teachers thought our grandma's language was a dirty language. But the stories we ran into were filled with yeses, and our lives were filled with stories. Pancho Villa and his horse, Los Indios, a woman so tough that when a snake bit her, she bit him right back and he died. Or the 500-year-old story of La Llorona, which made us shiver as Grandma whispered, Ay, mis hijos. Our literature was like a contraband treasure passed from generation to generation, whispered. Our stories taught us you can't judge a whole group of people by what others say. We knew our barrio was beautiful, as was any neighborhood where adults cared about their children. They gave them paletas, didn't they? In every color of the sarape the sassy sound of the accordion, the smell of crispy tacos, the taste of dreams. And I, with no books in the house and no library at school, dreamed of being a writer. And I was lucky enough to become one, but not by the recommended route. I did it by falling in love with the stories and their hoarse voices, being entranced by the color of their words, hearing them in my head until I could live out their lives through my performances. I wanted to document the beauty of my culture. 
I published my first book with Reyes and Cecilia right here in my West Side Barrio on the kitchen floor of Cecilia's house with a small printing press that would publish Caracol Arts Magazine. We took our back cover photo at the neighborhood tortilleria and then bought tortillas from them to show our gratitude. We call the book, Get Your Tortillas Together. <laughs> and once I started, I didn't stop. I loved every part of writing, whether it was performing in New Zealand or reading poetry in Ireland or helping young writers in Hutto, Texas. I even had the good luck to become president of the Texas Institute of Letters, where every year we recognize outstanding writers with awards that come with a check. And while writers get to travel some, their books get to travel even further. Poems I thought were all about the West Side had personal meaning for folks in Germany. And the children in Nairobi gave me a thumbs up for a book about paletas. But being a writer isn't always glamorous. It's sometimes about waiting years from when you birth this baby till it's finally in print. It's 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. Or as Texas author Jean Fowler says, it's staring at a blank sheet of paper till drops of blood form on your forehead. And you have to make room to live life, not just write about it. You have to make room to dance a polquita in a fishing cabin off the coast of Norway while pregnant to fall in love or climb a pyramid or struggle to do something really hard or sweat or listen to the real sheroes and heroes of your life because the real stories of your life are struggling to pay the bills or hugging your child even the headache that comes when you think you can take care of a baby and write a novel at the same time yeah right and the whole danger of having kids while writing is kind of like DWI, but it's called DWW, doing parenting while writing. You have to worry about the danger they might even follow your example and fall in love with reading and writing and forget to breathe. Because when I write, I still hear the voices of my ancestors whispering over my shoulder, a multicultural rainbow of voices. And I must confess, I am in love with the color of words. And what I want my office to look like is this. I'm not color phobic. I'm in love with the rainbow voices of my pueblo, with your voice, the uniqueness of it, the way it doesn't fit inside the boxes, just like you don't fit inside the boxes. You know the boxes, the ones at the beginning of forms that say, white, not Hispanic, black, not Hispanic, Hispanic, not Hispanic. We don't fit. A human being is more than the check marks in the boxes, more than race or age or gender or beauty. Our bodies are treasure chests with the stories hidden inside. But our history is written on our face, written in the breaking voice between the lines of a song. And when we write it down, we give it wings to travel everywhere. So treasure your own ability to paint with words, to lose yourself in a book, to fly in your own unique, don't fit in the boxes way, to imagine new worlds or create them. Take, taste the beauty of your stories. You have a history. We as a pueblo have a history, not just 300 years, 12,000 years of San Antonio's history right here. And we're still here still eating the tortillas and tamales that have been eaten here for over seven millennia, each with the beauty of our origins. So pour your story out, clean and clear and true from your heart. Don't let anyone silence you or your worth. Read, write, whisper the stories to each other late at night, yours, your grandmother's, your neighbor's grandmother's, because you are you, and you hold in your very essence the beauty of life, and that is the power of your story. Uh, all right, if I can ask you to, uh, or wait, I'll use this one and, and you use that one. Okay, got it. Okay. Uh, it's not on. It, it, it should be. Hello. Yeah, there you go. Just yell into it. Yell into uh, it something very personal. Something very personal. No, oh, no, okay. <laughs> Doesn't work. You're such a state official now as the Poet Laureate. What does that mean, by the way, to people who, who ask? Nothing. It means <laughs> nothing except that the, you go to the legislature and the Senate is, is the only good boys. The, the, you go to the, the House of Representatives and they're like a bunch of third graders that aren't paying attention and throwing paper wads and talking to each other. And you get up there and they decree you a state Poet Laureate and nobody's paying attention. 
and somebody takes a picture just to prove that it really happened, and then you leave. And then you go to the Senate, and they're like the good third grade boys. <laughs> they sit down, and they pay attention. And if anybody starts to whisper too loud, somebody bangs the gavel at the front and says, <clears throat> please. And then somebody gets up and makes a speech about you. And then you don't even get to be in there. You don't get to get near them. You have to stay up in the balcony and you stand up while they make the speech and then you sit down. And then you go on your own and then you've got to figure out what you can do for the rest of the year. Are you going to write some stories about those people, especially in the know. House? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I'll wait till they're out of office. Uh -huh. <laughs> we can only all wait that long. Uh, how did you get from San Antonio and that little... Uh, a horrible pothole that you were thrust into. And I love the picture, by the way. Did they say, stay Let's there, see. mija, stay there. Uh, Hold the yardstick. Yeah. Now, where, where did you grow up exactly on, on the I was West? on San Fernando Street. I tell people, across from Our Lady of the Lake, uh, there used to be a little parochial school called St. Martin's Hall, a little Catholic school. And across from St. Martin's Hall, there was a public school called Ivanhoe, which is now Cleta Rodriguez. And across from Cleta Rodriguez was a little street that around the corner turned into San Fernando, and that's where I grew up, San Fernando Street. And now what are you working on right now? I'm writing the biography of Emma Tenayuca together with Emma's niece, Cheryl, and I'm immersed in it. So if you see me and I'm mumbling and grumbling and looking very 1939, it's because that's where my mind is right now because I'm immersing myself in the story of somebody who's a real Shiro, and nobody's ever written a book about her except the children's book that Cheryl and I wrote. And I know there are a lot of people here that are very creative, want to know how you work. What's your process? You talked about it's not glamorous. Obviously it's not, but what, do you sit down? Do you lock yourself in a room? Do you get up every morning? Do you? Yeah, sometimes uh, it wakes you up at night and you have to write down what you're thinking of. Uh, so I keep paper and pen by the side of the bed. Sometimes you get up in the morning and you write all day long. Sometimes you're in the middle of something else and it hits you so you start to scribble things uh, on an envelope or a napkin or on your cell phone. <laughs> Sometimes I send myself emails with notes. It, it kind of takes over. It's a real cruel master. And when do, you th when do you think the book on Emma Tanayuka will be done? We always say nine months because it sounds like a baby and it'll be born, <laughs> you know, so uh, maybe about nine months, but then you turn it over to a press and then they take forever. But hopefully we'll get this one rolling pretty fast. And I know there are some other people out there that do films. Do you think uh, this book would turn into a great film about Yeah, that? we already have people interested. Really? Yeah. yeah. Do you have, have the Wallys interested. over there interested in this? Mm. We will see. You sell the rights? What do you do to a biography like that? Uh, yeah, you, you sell a screen option. And the option means they got sometimes 18 months, sometimes a little more, some wow. less, depends on what you sign, and they pay you a certain amount. If they don't get a contract within that amount of time, then they have to pay you another option for more money to keep it another 18 months, and if they don't get the contract within that time, then they have to pay you a ton of money, <laughs> uh, and if not, they get a contract and they have to pay you a little bit of money, or some money, and then you're supposed to get some royalties out of it, too. And if things go well, there'll be a movie about Emma Tenna Yuga. Yes, yes. And it's a struggle because we have always wanted the real Emma's life. She was bit larger than life, just as she was. We don't need to change her. And there have been people that have approached Cheryl and said, eh, couldn't we just change a few small things? Like, does she have to come from San Antonio? And does she have to be Mexican-American? Can't we just make her just a real heroine? We said, nope, wow. <laughs> can't do that. So. Well, Emma uh, Tenayuka, we look forward to seeing that movie. And are you gonna you're gonna do the, a, a screenplay adaptation? Well, yeah, we'll be involved in it. We'll be really? inputting. Yeah. Wow, you gonna move to Hollywood? No. <laughs> that <laughs> was a test, <laughs> and you passed. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for the State Poet Laureate of Texas, Carmen Tafoya. Thank you very much.